Would you be kind enough to pray with me? God, I bless you and I thank you for calling us into this fellowship with you, made possible only through Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in our love for the Trinity and for one another and especially for those who are heavy laden and far from you. Today, as we read and study your word, grow our understanding of the kingdom and our roles in it. Lord, whenever your church gathers, we pray for the kingdom of God to come and your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. May our will steadily decrease so that your will might increase. We depend upon your spirit to give us understanding and the desire to be remade in Christ's likeness. So come Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, I bind the attempts of the enemy to confuse, disinterest, distract, or discount the relevance of this message. And I loosed clarity and understanding and the ability to assimilate and then activate your ways of prayer and your plans for our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You can have a seat. One of the real regrets that I have is that these pew Bibles that are in front of you have no maps. So those of you who have not been on a pilgrimage to Israel are going to have to use a little bit more imagination than those of you who have. You see, uh, you'll be able to see in your mind's eye and if not in your mind's eye, you can certainly pull up all those pictures that are on your phone about the places where Jesus ministered in the Holy Land. We've been talking about many of those as we've been studying the Gospel of Matthew for the past few weeks. Now, if you haven't made the pilgrimage, let me just remind you that the Sea of Galilee is located in what would have been referred to as the northern kingdom. That's where Samaria was. Whereas Judah, which is the home of Jerusalem and the temple, is located in the southern kingdom of Judah. Okay, so two weeks ago, the scene of our gospel reading was in Galilee. Remember, northern kingdom. And this is where Jesus walked on the water. And it was after that that the shocked disciples exclaimed, You really are the Son of God. Last week's gospel reading, when CJ was here to preach, mentioned that Jesus and the disciples had gone up to the Gentile area of Tyre and Sidon, which are right on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea. And while they were there, Jesus healed the daughter of a Gentile woman, and then he and his disciples went down to Magdala. Now, you may not know this, even those of you who went on a pilgrimage to Israel, but Magdala was one of the largest Jewish cities around the Sea of Galilee, boasting a population of about 40,000 people. Caesarea Philippi is where we find Jesus today. Caesarea Philippi is just south of Mount Hermon, and you have to go way northeast into Israel to find Mount Hermon, and then come south a little bit to Caesarea Philippi which is where our gospel reading takes place today. Now, there's an ancient spring at Caesarea Philippi, and there's also a, a big cave there as well. And uh, outside the cave 
Uh, it's kind of as if it was carved into a rock wall because you just see this huge pinkish gold rock wall in front of you and there are niches that are carved into the face of that rock because people would place their idols because you see Caesarea Philippi was the pagan worship site of the god Pan, the god of nature. And I won't go into any details about it, but detestable and grotesque acts of pagan worship occurred at Caesarea Philippi. And in pagan minds, the place was even considered the gates of the underworld or the gates of Hades. And it was here that Simon reiterated that proclamation that the disciples had made earlier when Simon said, you are the Christ, son of the living God. And Jesus replied, as you'll see in verse 17, you are blessed, Simon, son of Jonah, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. Flesh and blood did not reveal this. Now I say to you, from this day forward, you are Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now the Greek words for Peter and rock sound a little bit similar. But God or Jesus was saying here, not that Peter would be the rock on which the church was built. But instead, that bedrock confession of faith that Peter made, that would be the bedrock. Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against this rock. Now, I don't think it was any accident that Jesus had this conversation with the disciples at Caesarea Philippi. I think he chose the location strategically because you can't help but to notice, as I described just a few minutes ago, that huge rock wall. Remember it, Joy? The rock wall that was in front of us? Rocks all the way around us. And clearly this place had a reputation because it was here that Jesus said, you see those gates? Well, the gates of hell are not going to pre prevail against the life of a believer in me. However, that doesn't mean that hell's forces aren't going to be nipping at your heels. Well, today we're going to spend most of our time in the last half of this passage because it focuses on kingdom prayer, which is the kind of prayer that you and I have the authority to use when hell's powers are at work all around us. Take a look at verse 19. Jesus said to his disciples, And I will give you the keys of the kingdom and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you bind or loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now the pronoun that Jesus used here was plural. And if he was speaking in Montgomery, he would have said, all y'all. But this message was intended for all the disciples who were in the hearing of Jesus. Jesus extended this authority to the whole group. And that authority still applies to the church today. Now, some of you may not ever have heard a prayer that has binding or loosing in it. But it's one of the prayer tools that 
um, we'll be practicing in our Novo course, which, as a shameless plug, begins in just 10 days. Prayers that bind or loose have to do with spiritual authority. In the first part of verse 19, Jesus says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. You means the church, the body of Christ. The spiritual authority, specifically as it relates to binding and loosing, reflects the relationship between what happens on earth and what happens in heaven. Jesus' statement here seems to confer a great deal of spiritual authority to the church to do something more than just jingle those keys. Kingdom prayer is divinely authorized access for heaven to invade earth. Binding and loosing are not a means of getting God to do what we want Him to do. God is not, as I've heard Father Andrew say before, like a gumball machine. In verse 19, Jesus says, Whatever you bind, and then it goes on to say, Whatever you loose, now, I think the scope of this statement is absolutely staggering because Jesus, if you'll notice, he gives no exception to what he's just said. Whatever you bind, whatever you loose, God backs up legitimate binding and loosing. Now, binding means that we restrict or we restrain or we lock up or tie down or we hold something down so that it can't escape. It's limiting the ability of something to do the action it was intended to do. Now, conversely, loosing means to release or to permit or to give the ability of something to function. Binding and loosing are authorities that are given specifically and only to the church. You see, the visible church, which is located on earth, actually represents the true church in the spiritual realm. And if you're not connected to Christ's church, then you're disconnected from the legal authority given to the church in the spiritual realm. Let me go back for a moment to the conclusion of verse 18. Jesus said, And the gates of hell shall not overpower it. The church that Jesus is building is so powerful that hell's gates can't stop it. He's referring to the church that's ordered and governed from heaven. And as I mentioned a minute ago, it's no coincidence that Jesus chose this place, referred to as the gates of hell, for this conversation. Because you see, in Old Testament references to gates, we see that that's a description used where legal transactions took place. <clears throat> That's where the elders of the city would go to decide legal cases. You see, hell operates legally on earth. But Jesus makes it clear that even while hell is operating legally here on earth, that nothing will prevail against God's church. And then Jesus goes on in verse 19 to say, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now the kingdom is the place of God's rule. And Jesus gives us the keys 
so that we have access to legislate from heaven back down here on earth where we live. Verse 19 concludes with whatever you bind on earth will, will have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall already have been loosed in heaven. So what exactly are we binding and loosing? Well, based on this passage, we're binding or restraining anything that comes out of hell. Binding restrains those things from having an illegitimate or a dominant influence. And loosing prayer occurs when something's already exerting some control or some dominant influence, and we agree with the work of Jesus so that we can release captives and set people free from the things that have bound us, which is exactly what we offer to our Celebrate Recovery members every Friday night. Heaven backs up what we do because Jesus is all about setting captives free. You see, if the problem is the gates of hell, then you need the keys of heaven that were given to the church because the church owns the keys. You don't have your own set of keys, by the way. The church has them. And you have to use those keys for your situation. Matthew 28, 18 says, All authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. So to get authority from heaven down here to earth, Jesus says, you have to come through me. Binding and loosing are like all the other prayer tools. They have to revolve around the centrality of Jesus. Now, binding and loosing, whether it's preventing the devil from tying up, or if it's releasing you if he's already tied you up, are connected to authority. That authority is tied to Christ. And Jesus only gives that authority to his church. Divine authority is exercised when the Father responds to our binding and loosing in the name of his Son. Now, it's important also for you to realize you're the one who has to do the binding and loosing because God doesn't do that for you. Let me describe an Old Testament illustration about authority. You might re recall this scene. It's from Exodus 17. It's when Israel was being attacked by the Amalekites and Moses and Aaron and Hur were on top of the hill watching the battle. Moses had in his hand the rod or the staff of God. And when Moses held up that rod or staff, Israel was winning. But when his arms grew tired and began to drop, the Amalekites began to win. Well, Aaron and Hur saw what was going on. So they wisely had Moses sit on a rock, and Moses or Aaron got on one side, Hur on the other, and they held up Moses' arms until the battle was won. Now, I want you to see that the success of the Israelites who were fighting had nothing to do with how hard they were trying or how hard they were fighting. What was happening on the ground 
was not ultimately determined by what the soldiers were doing on the ground. Yes, they still had to fight on the ground. But the power and the authority for the victory was not on the ground where they were fighting. Israel's authority and power and victory came from what was happening in the invisible realm. That's what determined whether they won or lost in the visible realm. Now, a lot of us are trying to get out of some messes. Some messes we've made for ourselves. But the real problem in solving those messes is that something's got to be solved in heaven first. If you're fighting for your marriage, if you're fighting against an addiction, against the tide of the culture, or whatever the situation happens to be that you're fighting against, yes, you have a responsibility to do what you ought to do. But that's not where the authority lies. I use this type of prayer several times each week. For example, I'll pray something like, uh, in the name of Jesus, I bind discord and dishonesty in our nation. And I release unity and truth. Or when I get put out with somebody and I really want to have my own way, I'll just, uh, I'll bind my selfishness and my ego and instead release humility and the desire to understand in Jesus' name. It's that simple. Whatever you bind and whatever you lose, God says, I will already <clears throat> have done it in heaven. So heaven is where the answer is. To put it another way, if you ignore the spiritual, if you ignore the keys, if you ignore the connection to the church, and if you ignore agreement with Jesus, you're not going to get the victory on heaven, on earth from heaven, while you're battling on earth. You're only going to get the victory on earth because you've engaged the authority of heaven. And I'll tell you, when you and I do that, then we'll see some binding and loosing. Binding and loosing means forbidding or permitting within God's conditional will. When we're submitted to his authority and our decisions align with God's will, John 14, 14 says, we may ask Jesus for anything, and in his name he will do it. And if you ever wonder what God's will looks like, I suggest you just take a look at what Jesus did. We have the authority that God has given us to bring heaven onto earth what has already been predetermined in heaven. Binding and loosing means that you and I have a lot to say about what happens on earth and in our lives and in our environments. So let's not neglect or take our God-given authority for granted or take this form of prayer casually. My exhortation to you today is very similar to the one that I left with you the last time that I stood here. Let's you and I exercise the authority that's already been given to us so that we can see greater advances of the kingdom of God on earth as it already is in heaven.
Now, Father, seal these truths in our spirits and in our minds. Protect and nurture them so that they bear fruit, not only for our personal freedom, but so that you can use our prayers to offer freedom to others from the lies of Satan. Amen. Would you stand with me?